a look at possibilities unfolding on the ground in, in Latin America with uh, Diego Sanchez and Cochia. And his publications focus on state society relations, income distribution, and production in small Latin American countries. And he's working on a book right now on are development-friendly social coalitions possible? I am going to move you from Latin America just to Central America and some small countries. And the reason um, is that actually I think it fits better to the things we want to discuss in at least two ways. The first is that for those of you that are um, social activists and not just students, um, and for example, you had the question yesterday about labor standards, I'm going to try to talk to you in, in, in terms of what um, the political economy of some of the um, processes that are taking place at the global um, sphere can influence how you try to do activism. The second is that I'm going to try to link production, um, distribution, and the issue of participation, of the issue of political inclusion in a broader sense, and I can do that better than the discussing inequality in the whole region. But of course, we can come to some of those points in the questions. What is going to be my starting point, and is the issue, is that development is to a large extent in developing countries about jobs, which by the way connects to potential struggles with the next session on what that means for the environment. Um, and not just more jobs, but better jobs. It was also behind um, Danny's talk yesterday about the structural um, change is very much about how you move people from bad jobs um, to good jobs. But the labor market is, more, is important for even more reasons. The, the first is that it actually is the place that links um, social and economic models, social and economic regimes. Um, the labor market influences very much the patterns of uh, social security and other types of social spending. It influences what you are going to do with education, etc., etc. And the final one is that actually labor market um, conditions um, and depends both on political and economic conditions. It does depend on whether you have the process of structural change that was discussed yesterday, but it does also depend on what you have not so much political democracy, but at least ability of different actors to influence the process of wage setting and um, the evolution of labor conditions. It is also political in the global sense. And again, the question yesterday was very clear, and it's something that is very much in the minds of many of you that work in movements against sweatshops, et cetera, that it is the labor market, the place where we can intervene and where we try to intervene in terms of the conditions, not just of workers, but of people, of families in the global economy. And the problem is that money parts of the world, um, and Central America being a very significant case, um, and I say the Caribbean Basin to include also the Dominican Republic, had done particularly bad in this creation of vibrant labor markets. They have done particularly bad both in the economic sphere, in creating good um, jobs, but also they have done bad in terms of the political of giving labor rights and um, trade union rights um, to people. And they have um, done so because, and I'm thinking historically, a combination of negative sets of both institutions and starting conditions that were important. The first was very unequal distribution of land and very much a specialization on uh, primary goods, together with weak labor movements and low state capacity, um, led to informal and, uh, informality and underemployment. So basically, we had a very powerful land-owning elite, which had very little incentive to either promote education or try to get higher wages, because wages were mainly a labor cost and not a way to increase the demand of having any positive effect. And again, this is not a story of um, a Central America only. There was a discussion just uh, now about um, the case of the Middle East. And it's a story that was, in some parts, very clear uh, for a long, long time, for the whole 20th century, if you want. Not for other cases, like Brazil, Argentina, and others, which actually experienced much better performance in terms of jobs um, that are before the 1980s than after. So here um, is where global production enters into Central America. We are in the 1980s. We have that transnational corporations are trying to uh, promote um, uh, outsourcing in different parts of the world, and they, they need to move from East Asia 
to places that are closer, and we have also that the Reagan administration was trying uh, to promote them as well. And the result has been not just in Central America, but in other parts, not just the diffusion of global production, but in particular, uh, an instrument to do that, which were the export processing zones. You have that, other than Asia, uh, Mexico, Central America, and the Caribbean had been the place where export processing zones were used to try to promote um, outsourcing mechanisms to try to produce assembly of apparel, electronics assembly, um, and in the case of Costa Rica, semiconductors as well. The diffusion of uh, global production shifted these economies dramatically. So um, in the case of Nicaragua, for example, between 1990 and 2005, primary exports, um, uh, which were the main source of uh, production, in fact, remember Honduras was called the Banana Republic for something, decreased from 76% to 35%. In the case of the Dominican Republic, now coffee and sugar, which traditionally were the big uh, uh, um, goods produced, represent only 2% of total exports today, even less if you take um, the tourist sector as a source of foreign exchange. And I'm interested then not just on how this process has led to opportunities for development or not, something that in principle will be discussed in the, uh, uh, later in the conference, not whether this has led to a middle income trap. For questions about that, you have to ask um, Eva. But I want to think about whether it has led to some trends that lead to more positive uh, coalitions, more positive labor uh, relations between workers and uh, firms in these countries. And I want to make clear um, that I'm not trying to establish causality or even be very clear. I know there's all kinds of country differences. I'm just trying to offer you a map of how to think about some of those relations. And I think we can identify at least three potential processes that have been um, taking place in a positive way in some of the Central American countries, and I think the Dominican Republic being actually the most significant in that process. The first um, has to do with um, the creation of what we can call transnational labor alliances. The fact that um, the creation of global production led to the US, in particular trade unions, to be more interested about what was happening in some of these countries. And they used um, a, a trade agreements, and in particular, in this case, not a trade agreement, but um, a, a trade clause in the US, the Caribbean Basin Initiative, to try to impose new laws uh, in some of these countries. So we have that the uh, risk of losing access to the US together with the collaboration between the um, AFL-CIO and uh, trade unions in these countries uh, resulted in shifts in labor codes in every single country during the 1990s. And again, you can think that this just was a change of laws, but having changes in paper are the first step to having changes in real application. Um, I, I, the case of the Dominican Republic, again, was very significant, uh, and when you talk um, with the now Vice President of the Republic, he's very clear. In 1990, uh, it was pressure from uh, trade unions locally with a coalition with American um, trade unions that actually forced them to either eliminate the code that existed be uh, before the 1960s uh, under the dictator Trujillo, or actually not have uh, more access for their apparel exports to the US. And the result was not just the creation of a new labor code, sorry, uh, but um, a more significantly, also a, a parallel um, expansion of trade uh, inspect, oh, sorry, of labor inspectors. So actually, the Dominican government, at the same time as shifted the code, um, a professionalized for the first time the part of the civil service that had to do with labor inspection. This is not unique, actually, to the Dominican Republic. It happened also um, in Guatemala um, to a, a lower but also significant extent. And the result has been something that Andrews Rank from the University of New Mexico describes very well. And this is these labor inspectors that are not, are not of the Anglo-Saxon um, type, but of the French-European type, 
go to companies and when they see that labor standards are not being met, instead of putting a fine and going home, try to work with the company in improving um, uh, conditions, in including not just conditions but productivity and expanding productivity, again linking to the issue that Danny was um, commenting on how you need productivity um, to improve wages and labor standards. And um, he shows very convincingly, and other shows very convincingly, how productivity has increased in those areas of the country that had had more significant labor inspection. How long will this process um, last is unclear, um, but at least we have a mechanism that we didn't have before and that we would not have had if it was not uh, international pressures. Of course, the, the second one um, is one that um, now the press is paying much more attention to. Um, it was in the New York Times a few weeks back, which has to do with corporate social responsibility and what we ask international companies. Um, as you know, now there's uh, big pressures on Apple in particular um, to try to influence the behavior of suppliers um, in China. This is actually nothing new um, in uh, other parts of the world, including Asia, but very clearly Central America, where the creation of global uh, networks didn't change uh, the situation of these countries, but made and built a specific and direct link between the producers in the north, many um, college students like you, and the labor conditions in um, the south, um, in places like the Dominican Republic, El Salvador, etc. So we have all kinds of cases of individual firms that were actually targeted for improving our labor conditions in a relatively successful way. So in the literature we have cases like uh, Mandarin International, a Taiwanese firm working in Central America, particularly in El Salvador, that uh, refused to improve labor standards and trade union rights until there was a um, coalition um, that involved the U.S. National Labor Committee and also the anti-sweepshop anti movement in the U.S. This has a positive and a negative um, effect. The positive is that according to some more recent um, work that um, people have done, um, that has led to a move, uh, an impact on state policy. Partly because um, now codes of conduct, which are um, accepted by some of the transnational corporations, are actually then evaluated on a periodic basis. And this allows the government, in a way, if you want to depend more on those evaluations and less on labor inspection. But also, um, work by Amenwal and others in the Dominican Republic shows that there are at least some positive collaboration between the government and some of these companies that are creating labor codes. The negative, however, is very much that this was always an individualized effort. So this was always about targeting a specific firms and getting trade union rights in a specific firms. But of course, improving labor conditions of 1,000 people on countries of four to 10 million is uh, a drop in the ocean, um, to say the least. Let me go with the third one, which has less to do with labor rights and how uh, global movements have influenced labor rights, <coughs> and more um, with the asymmetric incentive of local producers. Part of the problem in Central America, as I show you, is that um, the landowning elite had no incentive to have higher education. So they could, they can, they could, and they can today say, oh, we need a more educated labor force. The fact is that to uh, have coffee production they, um, or sugar production, they need very little um, education levels. This in Central America, not in other parts of the world, as uh, Mario and Jose Antonio and others uh, might discuss, um, didn't change a lot under import substitution. Import substitution was an attempt to industrialize on top of the dominance of the primary sector. And as a result, it led to some assembly for internal consumption, but not a lot of incentive for the improvement of education of other social conditions. And in fact, with the exception of Costa Rica, we have that um, spending levels in education remain below 3% in most Central American countries for the whole period. And there were also very limited 
training efforts in the country. This didn't change in particular um, during the first phase of assembly of apparel. Again, why? Because um, those women and men that are working in the apparel sector do not need a lot of um, skills, and therefore the firms were not particularly in, uh, interested in increasing incentives. However, as companies became um, incre face increasing competition, they had either the alternative of trying to improve their production processes, and that happened in the Dominican Republic, where training, the tr public training institution started to collaborate much more closely with local companies in the export processing zones, or they had the option of closing down. And I think we have, um, in Costa Rica and the Dominican Republic in particular, some um, clues of both transnational corporations and local firms that are produced for exports having more incentives to promote at least training operations uh, in that country, or in the case of Costa Rica with Intel, uh, um, modernizing and shifting some of the engineering programs in the country. Now the question, however, is that there's two processes. Sorry, it's too early, so I, I knew you wouldn't want to eat the cake um, um, yet. And has to do with um, what Danny said um, yesterday to the um, answer about labor conditions. And it has to do with the fact that um, labor conditions depend to a large extent on productivity. So you can have all the improvements that you want in labor standards or trade union rights that if you are not improving the size of the cake that is going to some of these local firms, and if you are not uh, improving the ability of some of these workers um, to get um, those rights, it will be um, very difficult to um, have a positive effect. So in a way, the main message I'm, going to, I'm trying to transmit is this conflict between structural constraints um, given by the inability to upgrade and get more rents for the country and some of the political successes that we might have witnessed in some of the countries. And i um, tell you two different processes that I think are influencing um, the size of the cake that actually is able to um, be distributed among workers. The first process has to do with increasing pressures on suppliers to try to be more productive and uh, redistribute more of the rents um, to the um, final global producer, producers, so GAP actually uh, requiring more and more stringent conditions on production. And the second uh, has to do also that these suppliers are always in a big, big risk of losing market um, share in some of these products. So what you have here in this graph is the market share of Central American and Caribbean exports of apparel into the US. So as you see, Initially, they were very successful. They reached up to 15% of all the imports that the US do, was doing on apparel in the 1990s, but this went down very significantly in the second half. Why? Because of a second graph that you have, which is the emergence of China. So very much suppliers found themselves after the elimination of the multi favor agreements competing with Chinese suppliers that have much higher levels of productivity and lower wages. So um, the, some of them were able to adapt, to move to new production, etc. but many of them actually had the risk of closing down. Even in areas uh, and countries that were able to move from apparel to other activities like semiconductors, the problem was that transnational corporations like Intel actually made decisions about how much profits to repatriate, how much production to see, um, how much research and development to make in specific countries in competition with subsidiaries in other parts of the world. And this is something Eva um, Pau shows very well in the 2005 book. It also, that actually, uh, the, there was a huge increasing gap between productivity and wage uh, per workers in some of that production. And here is where I um, would just make a caveat to this relation between productivity and wages that um, Danny was making. Here you have the increase in productivity in the export processing zones, 
uh, Intel arrives in 1998, in 1998, and then you have a huge increase. Partly has to do with capital investment, it's true, but partly also has to do with the nature of the new conditions. Here you have the evolution of wages per workers, and of course, the difference is very much the increase uh, profits that this um, that Intel and other transnational corporations got, and that because of global competition, uh, workers were not able to reap through higher, um, to much higher wages. The second big constraint, which would limit the cake to just one piece, um, is the fact that um, there's this also a structural constraints on workers. One has to do with what I just said, China and uh, East, uh, Europe and other parts of the world, which have uh, meant that they are competing now with billions of workers uh, in the global economy and uh, in more difficult conditions. But the second has to do with the process of structural change itself. The problem is that you can't try to influence as much as you want worker conditions in the export processing songs, that as long as these are much better jobs for men and especially for women than in many other activities in the economy, it will be very difficult to have a real bargaining over results. And remember, these are countries in which low productivity activities um, amount for at least 50 percent um, of total production in the Dominican Republic, 58 percent in Guatemala. So basically you have that workers, even in difficult conditions, will have always relatively limited incentives to fight for trade union rights in working conditions that tend to be better to the, that the reserve labor um, and reserve wage that they have in other parts of the, can of the country. Sorry, I took a little um, fast in the last part, but again, I'm very worried about the tackling. Um, let me conclude um, with A, the main message, and B, some lessons, I hope, for all of you, both as social scientists, but also as global activists, and uh, hopefully future policymakers, either in this country or in others. The main message is that we really need to consider this global process in terms of how they open or not opportunities for political processes, but also in communication to what we, they are doing in terms of the structural constraints on the economy. If we are not able to upgrade, in other words, a much of the political gains will be very difficult. So for social scientists, um, and I know it was quite fast, but I think we con need to continue advancing, not just in the big literature on how institutions are determined by political power, a la Semoglu and Robinson in a book that um, will uh, be published um, or has just been published, but really in a specific processes of globalization, structural change, increasing migration, try to understand in um, linking what are the political uh, influence that this has, migration leading to a new political elite in some countries, in conjunction with some of the economic processes. As global activists, I think I would encourage all of you to think about uh, what will be the second and third effects of some of the um, programs that we are trying to implement in some of these countries. Improving uh, conditions in one um, company, if that company is going to close down, will do very little. Or um, improving conditions in one company without understanding the dynamics of upgrading in the rest of the economy is, uh, will do very little. I, of course, don't want you to think and have uh, to do research on all of those, but at least to have the political vision of some of this process. Um, two more um, comments for policymakers. Of course, is the trivial in a way because you all know uh, conclusion about how do we uh, upgrade, how we are able to confront the Chinese um, risk if we are going to do the pro process of a structural change that we want, but how do we link this to new um, coalitions? It will be uh, almost impossible to have a real process of upgrading if we don't have both a new group of firms and some more power for labor unions to, shifting, to shift the incentives for all the companies in the country. At the end, I think, um, the message is that we do need to consider 
both the political and economic processes as we think um, about the impact of globalization. And we also need to consider that upgrading without so, uh, shifts in class coalitions and especially a strengthening of both union rights but shift in the incentive of firms will unlikely be, will be sustainable over time. Thank you so much.